Thank you. Good morning. I'm glad you're all here. I've been looking forward to this morning for a long time. I want to tell you the story about a weird animal. A weird animal is called the platypus. And if you believe in miracles, you might want to think about the platypus. Here are some strange facts about the little platypus. You know it has no teeth, and it takes sand, and it puts sand inside of its bills, and when it wants to chew on something, it grinds the stuff down with the sand. Doesn't that just sound great? It, it, it's, a, it's a mammal, and yet it lays eggs. Its eggs are kept inside of its tail. And not only that, but it doesn't have any mammary glands, per se, um, like other mammals. The little babies, they kind of nurse on the mom's skin in between the rolls of skin. Doesn't that sound cool? Um, so the platypus was some an animal. So in England, they went over to Australia where the platypus was, and, and they discovered this animal a little bigger than a rabbit. And they saw that this mammal laid eggs, and they, so they tried to, they brought it back, they brought their fur back, and they said, no, no, this is a mammal that lays eggs. And, and thinkers and, and people and smart people said, no, that's impossible. Reptiles lay eggs, mammals don't. And so they said, no, no, it does. And, and so because they were closed, because people said, no, no, you, you can't, that isn't true. See, that's ridiculous. That, that goes against our norm. That goes against everything that we know. And so they refused to believe it. This is a true story. And it took years and years, and, and people refused to believe it because what they had was they had this preconceived idea of what is truth, what is happening, and instead, there were other things at play. And so they went back down to Australia, and they brought back a pregnant, they actually killed the poor little platypus, sorry about that. They killed it, and they brought back the platypus with eggs in it, thus confounding and proving that platypuses do in fact lay eggs. This morning, we're going to talk about something unique. We're going to talk about something clearly impossible. We're going to talk about something utterly impossible. Listen to what Isaiah says. He says, this is what the Lord says. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. It springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm going to want you to turn to Luke chapter 24. If you're new to the Bible, that's, you've got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, then Luke. It's the very end of Luke. In fact, it might be easier if you turn John and go backwards and you could find Luke. So I encourage you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. I'm going to read a lot of the chapter in Luke. And um, it comes after an amazing thing happens. So women find the tomb is empty. Let me read in Luke 24. And then we'll talk about the empty tomb. I'm going to read just the first verse. On the first day of the week, that is Sunday morning. For the Jews, it would be Sunday morning. Every, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. See, the women, the women they saw Jesus crucified on the cross. There's the cross. The white represents the forgiveness of sins. The purple represents the fact that he is now king. They, they saw Jesus wounded. They saw him pierced on the side. They saw everything, and they took his lifeless body down, and they put it in a borrowed tomb. They didn't have time to prepare because of the coming Sabbath. They didn't have time to prepare the body as it would naturally be prepared, as it would rightly be prepared. And so they, they wrapped it in linen, and they put it inside the tomb. They closed it with a rock in front of it. And then, then they went and they celebrated the Passover and the Sabbath. And, and now they came back and they were mournful, they were sad, they were broken. It was probably the worst Passover that they had ever experienced. And as they're there, they, they get some spices and they're going to go early the first on Sunday morning. They're going to go and they're going to rightly prepare the body of Jesus. And when they get there, they, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. When they entered it, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, my friends, would be a tragedy. I've done many funerals in my time, and, and every funeral I've been to, when the casket is open, there is a body inside the casket. Imagine how distraught you would be. Imagine how discouraged you would be if all of a sudden you're going to the funeral of your loved one, a person that, that, you, that you love, that you cherish. You open up the casket, and there's nobody there. Wouldn't that kind of freak you out just a smidgen? Wouldn't that kind of make you upset? Wouldn't you kind of be going, oh no, something is wrong. This isn't right. Funeral home, what happened to the body of my loved one? These women, these women are discouraged. They're distressed. They're, they're sad. They're confused. And they open up and they find the tomb. They find the stone rolled away in front of the tomb. And all they see is the linens of Jesus' body. That would be very disheartening for them. See, we've got to deal with this as Christians. 
As followers of Jesus Christ, the whole entire story hinges on the fact, is the tomb empty or not? And so many people have come up with theories to try to, you know, counteract the fact that the tomb was empty. Some people say, you know, the tomb is empty, and, and because it was empty, what happened is those disciples up there, uh, Peter and Thomas and Matthew and, and James, you know, Judas, not Judas, he, he's, he definitely didn't steal the body. Um, you know, Thaddeus and, and all those guys, what they did was they stole the body. They, these fishermen, these cowardly, I mean, these brave warriors, uh, what they did was they, they confounded the Roman soldiers, they, they defeated the Roman soldiers, and they moved the stone away, they stole the body, and then they were willing to die for the lie that they knew. They were willing to be dragged into the streets as one of them was. They were willing to be beheaded for a lie. They were willing to be, um, one was crucified upside down. They were willing to be traumatized and tortured for a lie. It doesn't hold weight. They didn't steal the body. That is just not a good theory. Well, there's another theory that goes around, well, the tomb was empty because the women went to the wrong tomb. Oh, oh, wait, it was that tomb over here. No, no, it was that tomb back here. No, no, it was the tomb over here. The problem with that theory is that all the um, Jewish leaders, all the leaders, all they have to do is say, hey, hey, confused disciples of Jesus, the tomb is right here, and the body of Jesus is right here. Can't you guys get anything straight? See, all they have to do is show them where the real tomb is, and they could confuse. For some of you, it's a hallucination theory. It's, it's, well, there was a mass hallucination. They saw Jesus, really, they were just confused. And for some of you, that little circle's going round and round, right? It's really not. It's actually holding perfectly still. It's your eyes playing tricks on you. Now you're trying to figure out whether or not that thing's going round and round, aren't you? And, but but it's, a, it's a, an illusion. And they think that, well, what happened was the disciples, well, they, they hallucinated. And that isn't true because, once again, the religious leaders, all they had to do was say, you can hallucinate all you want. Here's the body of Jesus. There's the tomb. It's there. And all of that but it goes against what we know about psychological theory. The swoon, the swoon theory is kind of like magic. Jesus, executed by a professional Roman soldier, a guy who pierces this side and, and blood and water gush out, a guy who didn't even have to break the legs of the person on the cross because Jesus had already given up his spirit. He said that Jesus was dead. The Romans know how to kill people. They were very good at it. They knew that Jesus was dead. The swoon theory that Jesus, this mauled and massacred and beat up guy, literally got out of the tomb on his own, and now he's proclaiming that he is, he is the savior of the world. That doesn't work either. See, the tomb was empty. Other people talk about the relocated body theory. It is true. It is true in Jewish culture. They take, they take the body and they put it in ossuary. But you've got to wait about a year for that to happen. You've got to wait for all the flesh to decompose. You've got to wait for all the flesh and, and the bones, I mean the, the meat of the bones to decompose. And then you take the skeleton and you put it in an ossuary. And maybe you take it with you when you're going to move. Because you're going to move to a different place. But this is three days later. This is not a year and a half later. And then there's always the copycat theory. People say, you know what, Christianity is just a copycat of other religions that are out there. There is the um, idea of, what is, Arias um, and Odysseus and Dionysus and all those other Greeks that, that what they did was they had myths that said, well, this person, what he'd do, he'd rise and then he would die and then he'd rise again and then he would die. And a lot of times it was to explain seasons of the year problem with that is Jesus was a real live human being. He had flesh and blood. He was not a myth. Historical non-Christian scholarship proves that there was a man named Jesus that walked at the same time that the Bible says that there was a man named Jesus. you got to deal with the empty tomb. You can't just say Christianity isn't true. you got to deal with the facts of the empty tomb. And so the women, they come to the tomb and the tomb is empty. And they're shattered, they're broken, they don't know what to do next, they're kind of concerned. And so, while they're wondering, listen, while they're wondering, they're going, uh-oh, suddenly, two men in clothes that gleam like lightning stood beside them. You can kind of see the special effects, can't you? Um, the glowing and the light, and, and in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, and wouldn't you? Absolutely, if, if you got a, like a real live, non-special effect, you're going to go, what do we do here? And so you bow down to these things. And they say, but the men 
say this, why do you look for the living among the dead? Oh, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. The angels testify, the women are just going, what? Then the angels challenge these ladies, and he says, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. He said this, he said, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinners to be crucified on a third day and rise again. And, and they remember those words because in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, that's exactly what Jesus says. He says, we're heading to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, the Son of Man, he's going to be, he's going to be handed over to the religious leaders and he's going to be crucified. He's going to be dead. And, and in three days, I'll rise again. And again, it says it twice in Luke chapter 9. And then in Luke chapter 18, he says the same thing. Just before Passion Week, the Son of Man is going to be crucified. He's going to be beaten, but he's not going to stay in the grave. We just, thought, we just sung a song about the borrowed tomb. It, it's just, it, it was a rental for him. The tomb was short term. And, and so Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And all of a sudden, look at, and they remembered his word. And now the women, the women know that the tomb is supposed to be empty. He's not supposed to be here. He's alive. And they get all excited. But Luke doesn't portray their excitement. And Luke just casually says, and they come back from the tomb. Well, well, we got some great insight from the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew. I'm pointing to Matt right there. That's, that's your book, buddy. Um, Gospel of Matthew. So the women hurried away from the tomb. They, they hurried away from the tomb. Afraid? And yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. And so, and so these women are going, Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> or are they being like some of you guys, just a woohoohoo? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, these women are just, they're, they're out of their mind. They don't know what to do. And they go in to tell his disciples. And then what do you think the response of the disciples are going to be? All right, this is great. We did it. He, he's risen from the dead. Is that what the disciples are going to do? No. They're going to sit with their arms folded. And they're going, these are just a bunch of crazy women. Do you think so? Watch what the text say. The text says, and they told them these things to the eleven. And it was Mary Magdalene, Jonah, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them told this to the apostles. <laughs> But they didn't believe the women because it seemed like a story about a platypus. <laughs> Ridiculous, crazy, miracles don't happen. Dead men don't rise from the graves. And the word seems like nonsense. One of the disciples is James. Mom, you're making us up. Mom, you're nuts. Mom, mom, did you, did you, you know, a little before this morning? I don't know, mom, come on. You know how a, a son can really cut to the quick to the mom. Mom, Mom, I, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. And the women were so excited. The women were thrilled. We saw, we saw men. There are two guys. Luke only mentions one. Two guys that said, well, we're going to check this out. We know that Peter and John run to the tomb. Luke only mentions Peter. But we know that John's there. And they run to the tomb to check it out. Well, well how do we know if the women are telling the story or not? And they run to the tomb. We know from the Gospel of John that that oh Peter busts in first <laughs> and then so then John says that but bending over they saw the strips of linen lined by themselves and went away wondering to himself what had happened Peter he doesn't remember Luke chapter 19 I'm chapter 9 he doesn't remember Luke chapter 18 he doesn't he, he's dumbfounded he saw Jesus hanging on a cross he, he knows where the tomb is at the tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. The women are, are acting all crazily excited. He doesn't know what to do. A couple of other men that were listening to the story from the women, they also leave the room, and, and these, these men are going to walk out of town. They're going to leave. They're going to abandon their upper room because things are getting a little crazy. Things are getting out of sort. And now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were going to take a walk. It was going to be about a seven-mile walk. If you were to take a walk from here about seven miles, and if you are going to go due west, you'd have to walk to about Kaiser Fontana. How many of you want to walk there this afternoon? Not many of you, huh? How about due east? You'd almost get the sprouts. 
But due east would be, I say that for those who were there, due east would be about seven miles. So Walmart off of California, about seven miles from this location. If you were to kind of go northeast, that's east, you'd go kind of northeast there, you'd go to St. Bernadine's Hospital. And you could walk there this morning instead of drive to work. You could do that, or if you were going to do south, you'd go to the 91, 215, 60 interchange. But you're going to want to walk farther than that because there is nothing at the interchange that you're going to want to see. And so whatever way, it's going to take you about two and a half hours to walk. If you're, if you're lazy like me, it might take you three and a half to four hours. If you take the bus, it'll take all day. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a long walk. What I find amazing is that, is that Jesus, he, he has a lot of people to visit on this day, first day of the week. He spends hours with a couple of guys, one of whom we don't even know who it is. And so these two guys, they started walking, and as they were walking with each other, they started talking about everything that had happened. I'll give you a fill in the blank here. They're walking, they're walking, and then there's an interruption in their life. I believe that's how God communicates to us many times. God likes to interrupt our life. Sometimes he'll do it subtly like he's going to do with these guys. Other times he's going to do it dramatically. He's going to input himself right into the middle of it. The question is, are we going to take time to ponder and say, yes, God is talking to me in the midst of this? Suddenly, there was an appearance. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came along and he walked with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. That's the second thing. They're going to have this interaction, and this interaction is going to be such that they're not going to quite understand who this person is. They're just going to assume that this guy is an out-of-towner, and he's not been here for the last couple of days. So there's an interaction they question to the disciples. He asks this guy, this stranger to them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? He hears them conversing. He comes up and he joins in their conversation. Hey, by the way, what are you guys talking about? What, what you, what's going on? Tell me a little bit about what you're talking about. And they stood with their face downcast. The idea of the word downcast is that their faces were sad and gloomy. Contrast that to the faces of the women. Oh, he has risen. Wow, the tomb is empty. They just can't stop talking. Mom, you're nuts compared to this guy. They're sad. What are they supposed to make? The tomb is empty. Their Messiah was crucified on the cross. The one that they thought was going to redeem Israel. The one that they thought was going to change everything. He died. The religious leaders put him to death. And so the man that they don't know, he asks them the question, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And one of them named Cleopas. I love the fact that his name is Cleopas, because we don't know anything about him. We know very little about who he is. We know even less about his friend. His friend doesn't even have a name. Jesus could spend all this time talking with the apostles, those, those 11 there, talking with the women, and he chooses to spend his time on the first day of the week with nobody. With a nobody. With a person who doesn't change the course of history that we know it. With a you and with a me. Jesus, the risen Lord, is going to spend hours talking to regular people, talking to us, addressing our questions and our fears, and he's going to show us some things that are quite important. And so Cleopas says, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in the last three days? Oh, come on, come on, stranger, don't you, haven't you heard anything? And Jesus calmly says, what thing? What happened? Isn't that a hoot? You guys, put a smile on your face. Jesus Christ. He, he was just, you know, risen from the dead. And, yeah, what things? You know, can, can you see answer from him? Um, and he's just probing them to get them to talk about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. So they recognized who Jesus was. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed. And the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. The whips, the chains, the brokenness, the burial, the tomb. It's empty. Everything that they believed in, everything that they thought crushed. And what is more, it's been three days. So 
since that has happened. Things are just going crazy, they're sad, they're discouraged, they're despondent. In addition, now it gets a little weird, stranger. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning and they didn't find his body. They came and they told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And we think these women are crazy. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the woman said. And now we're really confused because they didn't see Jesus. And Jesus' response to these discouraged, depressed believers, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things to and enter into his glory? There's an interpretation. Then he shows them what's going to happen. This is going to be great. And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I've heard this song, and I came and I looked at this little poem about Jesus in all the Old Testament books. And this should really get us stirring, because imagine Jesus is walking with Cleopas and, and the disciple, who we don't know. I'll call him Paul. And he's walking down the road, and he's, and he's going he's gonna to illuminate the Old Testament in a way that has never been shared before. I wonder if he showed Jesus as the creator and promised redeemer. In Exodus, as a Passover lamb. In Leviticus, the high priest, numbers the water in the desert. Deuteronomy, he becomes the curse for us. And Joshua, and Joshua, maybe Jesus showed that he was the commander of the army of the Lord, and, or Jesus as delivering us from injustice, or according to Ruth, as our kinsman redeemer. First Samuel, he is the prophet, the priest, and the king. He is the king of grace and love in Second Samuel. He is a ruler greater than Solomon, and he is the powerful prophet in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. He is the son of David that is coming to rule. He is the king who reigns eternally. And Ezra, the priest proclaiming freedom. And Nehemiah, the one who restores what is broken down. Amen. This is about Jesus. And Esther, he's the protector of his people. And Job, he is the mediator between God and man. In Psalms, he is our song in the morning and in the evening. And in Proverbs, he is our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is the meaning of life. The Song of Solomon, he is the author of faithful love. Isaiah, he is a suffering servant. Jeremiah, he is the weeping Messiah. Lamentations, he assumes God's wrath for us. Ezekiel, the son of man. Daniel, he is a stranger in the fire with us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And who is that other person in there? Hosea, he is a faithful husband, even when we run away. And Joel, he is sending his spirit to his people. In Amos, he delivers justice to the oppressed, and he continues his conversation to these followers of Jesus. And Obadiah, he's a judge of those who do evil. And Jonah, he is the great missionary. And Micah, he casts our sin to the sea of forgetfulness. And Nahum, he proclaims a future world peace we can only imagine. In Habakkuk, he crushes injustice. In Zephaniah, he's a warrior who saves. In Haggai, he restores our worship. In Zechariah, prophecies of the Messiah being pierced for us. In Malachi, the son of righteousness who brings healing. And beginning with Moses and, the, and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Would you not love to take that class? That's what it is, church. And so, and so he illuminates, he opens up their minds a little bit about what the scripture says. And as they approach the village, they're now at Walmart, or they're now at St. Bernadine's, they're now seven miles away. Jesus continues as if going on, thank you guys, it's been a good trip, I, I, I gotta continue. No, 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 can you please stay? They urged him strongly, please, please stay. For it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over, so he went with them. And that's the connection, the aha moment. 
And Jesus is going to do something in that text. He's going to do something that is going to be the thing that brings them to faith. And maybe for some of you, this is it. Maybe for some of you there's an aha moment. Rather, it is the fact that, that there is no good theory outside of the, tr the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's your aha moment to, to accept Jesus as Savior. Maybe you need to see Jesus woven through the Old Testament to see him as Lord. Maybe you need a refresher course to be reminded of the promises that he made along the way in Luke 9 and in Luke 18. Maybe you need an aha moment this morning. You're here this morning because... Because it's what we do as Christians we come to church on Easter. But you need to be here instead to worship the Lord, the one who conquered sin and death, the one who rose from the grave, the one who died for you and for me. And so the text says, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. We do this once a month. We have communion. He broke the bread. Have this. I wonder when he did that if they saw the scars in his hands. And they go, oh, oh Jesus. And he opened their eyes, were open, they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Ah, oh, Jesus. And so they are seven miles away. They got to go back to Jerusalem. It's going to be a long run. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road, and he opened up our scriptures to us. And sometimes, church, that's what we need. We need to open up the scriptures so that our hearts can burn with the truth as God longs to speak to you in his word. He longs to speak to you and, and have illuminate, open up his word so that you can see the Messiah in every book of the Bible. And then there's a the conviction. You got the conviction. This is, you got to share the truth with one another. You've got to talk to other people. A lot of times, I've said this before, we have people in this church and, and Christians around who keep their Christianity to themselves. Imagine what would happen if that's where the story of Cleopas and his friend ended. They, they went to Emmaus and they stayed there. That's it. Okay, we met Jesus, we heard about Jesus, and we're good. Wouldn't that be a dud of a story? Wouldn't it be horrible? I wonder how many Christians of us are like that, though. We, we accept Jesus as our Lord, and we don't tell anybody. We don't share with anybody. We don't let anybody know. And so the text says they got up and returned to Jerusalem at once. Now, now they were seven miles away. It was getting dark. It was probably dark. They had to run in the dark. You try running in the dark. No street lights. You know, the little candle. Shoot, you can't go very fast. The candle's burning out. <laughs> oh, that would be kind of weird. I thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> and they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. And then they found the eleven. Where were the eleven back in the room? And assembled together, saying this. And they're saying, it is true. The Lord. Actually, this is how they're doing. It is true. I need water. It is, it is true. Can't you see that? They just ran seven miles. Come on. They're breathing. They're sweating. It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two of them, and then they told what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus recognized, and how Jesus was recognized them when he broke the bread. Church of Jesus Christ. I don't know what it is that's going to help us recognize Jesus, but I pray that it is, it is the stories that we tell one another about Jesus interacting with us, engaging with us, sharing with us, and, and the hope that we have of the living hope of Jesus Christ. Wednesday night, we had this great moment on Wednesday night after the Bible study. It was a great moment, kind of almost a celebration broke out because Tony Garcia shared how, how he is now cancer-free, and, and operations happen and he's cancer-free. And then, then Denise shared about how she got her daughter back, and, and her daughter wandered away, and there was great celebration about that. And, and we're just celebrating what God has done, and those are stories, God moments in our lives, and we need to share our interactions with them about how God interacts with our lives on a weekly and on a daily basis. So this week, my application to, to this story is you tell somebody, tell somebody that the tomb is empty, and because he has broken the chains, as Trevon shared, the chains of sin and the chains of death, you are now alive. 
And so, you know the thing, we do this, we say, he is risen, and you say, he is risen indeed. And then we say, he is alive, he and you is say, alive indeed. and now I'm going to want you to say this, because I'm alive, wait, wait. I'm because, I'm wait, I'm alive, alive because he is risen, I read it. Okay, and then I want to say this, ready? I'm, I'm alive because, because he is risen. So live as living, gospel-centered, jumping for joy, believers in the resurrection. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that that tomb is empty. Because the tomb is empty, Lord, you are alive. Lord, I pray that as we contemplate that, we think about that, we hear the stories from our friends and our family about you working in our lives. Lord, I pray that that would be the thing that gives the aha moment for people to come to know you. Lord, if there is anyone here this morning who has never given their heart to you, if there is anyone here who, who is shy and they've never accepted you, they, they've pushed you off, Lord, they said, I don't believe in the Bible, Lord, and they've never dealt with the empty tomb, pray, Lord, that they would see and they would know that the tomb is empty and they are going to be accountable to you for the empty tomb. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity for them to ask you into their heart. Pray, Lord, that you would speak to them. You would guide them. For the rest of us, Lord, we just need a refresher for us. We need to be reminded of your word, Lord. Speak to us. Remind us of those great words you gave. And Lord, may your spirit invade us and interrupt us anytime you want this week. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.